Since we're talking about spirit, or wind, or breath, all the same word in both Hebrew and Greek, uh, let us for a moment take a deep breath all together. And then let it out slowly. And that breath that you took in and you let out is the breath of God. It's the breath that God used in creating the earth, our little world, surrounded by an atmosphere of air, of breath, of wind, surrounded by that with just enough gravity to hold it there. Just enough. Um, this, this month, an announcement was made that the searchers for exoplanets, the planets around other stars, have discovered one only four light years away. Uh, it's not visible to the naked eye, and it takes at least the 12-inch telescope to see it, or 24-inch, I'm sorry, to see it. It's a, it's a white dwarf, that is, it's a, a star that is dying, and it's weak and, and small, it's about the size of Jupiter, and it has at least three planets around it, three of them, rocky planets, they expect, and are within the zone where life might be. The thing is, they, since the, the whole of, the, of space is filled with moisture, it may have enough moisture for life, so it needs that. It also may have an atmosphere. If they have an atmosphere, they have to be big enough, enough gravity to hold it. Look at Mars, for instance, who is smaller than the Earth, Gravity, much weaker, has lost almost all of its atmosphere. So here's three planets that may hold life, or at least two of them. One of them is pretty close and too hot, probably, for human life as we know it. But interestingly, that the breath of God who filled the earth and filled the space with stars and planets and galaxies all over the place may have provided life somewhere else as well with the same breath that we are breathing, the breath of stardust, the breath from creation. So when we breathe in, we breathe not only in God's breath, we breathe in each other's. And our breath goes out to another person, to plants, to trees, to animals. It gives them life. Without breath, we have no life. We have no physical life. We may have, without needing breath, the life of the spirit. We may be breath, since spirit and breath are the same. What happens to us, we don't know. And we are told not to worry about it. That God will provide us with what we need to be recognized by each other, to continue to grow, to continue to worship God, to continue to spread the word, the news, to be with and for each other. Pentecost is that way. The disciples, or the followers of Jesus, about 150, who tells us in the story, are gathered together in Galilee, in the house, or in Jerusalem, but in the house that they were uh, five weeks ago uh, at the resurrection. They were wondering what to do next. They were perplexed. They were a little anxious, no doubt. And it was Pentecost, so they were celebrating this feast, this Jewish feast, which is always 50 days, or actually 49 in the old rec, if you count the days, it's 49, but 50 is the way they counted it in the biblical days somehow. And uh, so we have them gathered for this harvest festival Passover was the, was the liberation festival where they left Egypt uh, and wandered to the, to the, through the desert and through the promised land. This is the harvest festival, the first fruits offered up to God, offered as a celebration. It also became known as the time that Moses received the law, the Torah, that guided and governed uh, the people. So this was the celebration that they were all gathered for. And people from all over came to that. Jews from all over these different places uh, around the world and other 
people too that were proselytes, not Jews, but were interested in the religion, were interested in God's work, coming together to celebrate this great celebration of uh, Pentecost. And the Christians were there too. Or they weren't, were they called Christians? Not yet, I think. But they were gathered there, the followers of Jesus. And you heard the story. They were in this room, and all of a sudden, the organs started going, or the hurricane started coming outside. The wind started blowing, the Holy Spirit blowing through like a cyclone. Have you ever been in one? It's an amazing thing. We went through a tornado in Florida. Uh, we were at the airport in Orlando when this tornado came. It brought some damage all around, uh, and it came right over the airport. And we were in these big cement buildings, and we went outside and felt that wind blowing through around the parking lot and the, down the, uh, the roads and, and, uh, and watching the trees you know, blowing leaves and branches off. And we would all, could all step back inside if we felt threatened. But it was a wonderful feeling. People who love to go outside when it's really windy would probably be people who are open to this kind of spirit flowing that came through at Pentecost for our disciples. If you don't like that, you know, you have to get the spirit another way. Perhaps down on your knees somewhere for two prayer. But uh, the spirit comes and works in all kinds of ways for different people, different, different uh, trips. So what are some of the things that we can do? If you grade yourself on a scale of one to 10, like they ask you to in the hospital all the time, how much pain do you have? Uh, one means none at all, and 10 means excruciating. If you judge the amount of spiritual health you have, how strong is the Holy Spirit in you between one being nothing and 10 being you're on fire? Just don't tell people, but just think about it a bit. What would be your number? Okay, are you satisfied with your score? Would you like, have you gotten too low a score to pass? <laughs> then, then it's time to do something about it. And what can you do about it? Well, I think the best thing to do about it is pray. And pray with your hands open. Pray is as they, down in the catacombs under Rome, there are paintings on the wall where hundreds or thousands of people thousands of years ago have been living there and buried there. And, and many of the paintings are of women with their hands up like this in prayer, kneeling or standing with their hands out and open. Now you might feel self-conscious doing that, but in, in your own way. I do it when I pray. You see me doing that when I'm celebrating communion or when I'm praying the prayer of the day. Uh, and you do it when you come up to take communion. Open your hands so that the Spirit can, that you're, you're inviting the Spirit to come into you. And pray for that. Be careful what you pray for, because you might get it. You probably will get it one way or another. I can remember at Holy Instance Church, I was doing a whole lot of stuff on the Holy Spirit. And we had uh, a lot of weddings in the church, because it was a beautiful place. And uh, um, one of our fundamentalist brethren came and wanted to use the church for a wedding. I said, sure, if I was in this great openness, hospitality was what we were trying to do there. And uh, I, so I sat in the congregation to hear what he had to say. And he turned purple, I, really purple. He just ranted and raged up and down the aisles and vindictive to everybody and everything, that they were all sinners and they should, you know, throw themselves down on the ground and repent. And it was a, a wedding. <laughs> I had to get up and walk out and I was surprised that he didn't fall over uh, with a heart attack. He looked like he was just about ready to. It was, a, it was a terrible thing. So I thought after that I'll be very careful about praying for the Holy Spirit filling this place. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to get. And you might get more than you think. And are you ready for Are you ready to change? Because it might change you. If, you, if the Holy Spirit comes to you, 
you might find that all of the things you've been doing, all the things you've been working on or saving for, or all of the training you have is going out the window and something else is taking place. You know, I, my own life, I was, you know, a, a, a professional mariner, Richard Green Academy, and uh, when I had gone to sea, I'd been a naval officer, and now I was working ashore uh, as an operations manager at an oil company, well, Green Operations Manager, and uh, with 20 ships, big super tankers in world trade, uh, J. Paul Getty's company, so we knew that we were financially stable. <laughs> and, and that he would write in the log books questions about something and send them to me. He read all of the log books of all the ships, or at least some of them, and had comments, and they would come down to me, and I would have to look and see what was happening with the ship and all of that. A good job. I got a job with lots of potential. My mother thought it was great to work for an oil company, you know, get jobs, get security for the rest of your life. Uh, and then I, then I, I had developed a, the idea of doing weather routing of, of ships across the ocean and found that there was somebody that did that. And so I brought our ships to him and he I brought me to him too. He hired me at a salary that, that I couldn't refuse. And I was the heir apparent of this company, these two people and myself. But I had so much free time and I worked, I was volunteering things in the church and I was praying for more involvement in the church. And I decided I would read for orders. In the Episcopal Church, you could, didn't have to go to seminary to become a deacon. You could meet with seminary professors on weekends and study uh, at home and continue your work. You'd be a worker priest or deacon. And I told my boss about it. And he fired me on the spot. He was one of those people who was so uh, offended by religion that he had memorized, I think, all of the worst parts of the Old Testament. And he kept throwing them at me. Do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? Well, I hadn't read all of the Old Testament. But most of those parts I would skip over anyway. So, <laughs> at that time. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so I, I had no job now. I had a wife and three children and to, to support. And so I went back to sea, of course, but that's not a way to prepare for seminary. I thought, if I was going to go to seminary now, no reason not to go all the way. And a friend of mine suggested that I start the company in competition with him. And I did. Hired another guy that he had fired who was a meteorologist. And we worked together. Opened an office at San Jose State where they had the Department of Meteorology. Had our own wire circuits coming, wire services coming in from San Francisco, from the National Weather Service there and teletypes to uh, Mackay and uh, RCA to send messages to the ships. And we had lots of business going where we both could go to school and take turns being there. Had a really good answering service who you would think was in the front desk of our little office <laughs> upstairs in a, in a little shack in the place. But uh, um, it became a, a, a way to go to seminary. And by the time I was in my end of my second year in the seminary, uh, I wanted to do something. I was going to go on to become a minister, and I wanted to protect our investors, so somebody would have to take my place. And we merged with another company and uh, became the largest private meteorological company in the world, 